are not actually native to the North American landscape, contrary to what a lot of people believe. They became extinct here during the last ice age and were reintroduced by the Spanish conquistadors in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, despite being an invasive species, they're currently federally protected under the Wild Bureau and Horse and Burrow Act of 1971 as living symbols of the historic pioneer spirit of the West. And per this act, the population is managed by the Bureau of Land Management so that the range homes are healthy enough for multiple people. Um, and it's an extremely controversial aspect of rainland management because, like I said, you're using taxpayers' money to essentially protect the invasive species. Also, um, it infringes on the grazing rights and the livelihood of local rangers, and it can have significant impacts on the environment, especially if their populations are not managed correctly, because they can drastically alter the vegetation and soil characteristics of the rangeland, which then has implications for the other animals present. And most research in this area is going to focus on the grazing and the population effects of the horses rather than on how they're affecting the other animals within the ecosystem. So this is a unique study in that it focuses on the small animals. Um, the next part of the research is the post-wildfire receipt. After a wildfire, land management agencies will typically go through and receive hundreds of thousands of acres with a bit essentially an invasive species. So in this instance, it's a cultivar of the much wheatgrass. And the goal there is to essentially recover the lands that you reduce topsoil erosion um, and protect the topsoil. And it's controversial for a lot of reasons because first and foremost, we don't know how effective it is. Second, um, a lot of people say that it just introduces competition for native plant species, which obviously it does. And also a lot of people say that it just means an increase in the carrying capacity of the plant, which will then increase profit for land management agencies because they can more capital in the area. Um, and very little is known about how it's impacting the landscape or the communities, despite how widespread it is. So in this study, I focused on small mammals. Um, they're a keystone species in the rangeland environment. They play hugely important roles in seed dispersal and predation, urban breeding, and then soil perturbation and aeration. So changes in their communities is then going to affect soil quality and the vegetation and then other herbivores within the ecosystem, and then also ultimately the predators. So they're the keystone species that have links to all other aspects of the ecosystem. And the purpose of this study specifically was to investigate the impacts of feral horse populations and the post wildfire receding on small mammals adversely enriched in the sand space and current management area in the White Mountains. And in doing this, we wanted to elucidate potential pathways for differences in the small mammal populations. So we characterized the vegetation as first percent cover of forbs and grasses, and then also analyzed the soil for penetrance and pH just so we would understand the impacts of the populations that did exist. And what we presume is that horses are going to alter the soil and vegetation, which will change the available habitat. Or small mammals. Similarly, grease seedings are going to reduce vegetation diversity because it's essentially a monoculture of one grass, which is going to eliminate habitat niches for different native species. So we expected to see small mammal populations having lower abundance and diversity in areas that had more use by large graders, i.e. more occupied by feral horses, and also had decreased native flora, so they would seed it, um, which led us to two testable predictions. One, that treatment areas not occupied by feral horses but have higher small mammal species, species diversity and richness when compared to areas that were occupied by feral horses. And two, the treatment areas with higher abundance of native vegetation, but have higher small mammal diversity and abundance and richness when compared to the treatment areas that have been received with the non native vegetation. So, first, we established our study site. This is in the Sands Basin Herd Management Area south of Marcy in the Waikiki Mountains. Um, and within this treatment area, or within this herd management area, it had actually been burned and then reseeded in the last few years on one portion of it. So I had four treatment areas. I had a seeded area that was not occupied by horses, a seeded area occupied by horses, a native vegetation area not occupied by horses, and a native vegetation area occupied by horses. Um, and all of these areas are essentially adjacent to each other, so they are controlled for climate, geography, and land management. The only thing different is whether or not they get seeded and whether or not they have horses. So within each of these treatment areas, I set up four traffic grids. There were about 2.25 hectares each, so 150 meters by 150 meters. And the first thing we did was characterize the soil and vegetation. So we analyzed soil compaction, which took values at 50 random locations within each grid. And then we also took core samples that were then analyzed for pH. And the next thing we did was sample the vegetation. We used the double percent cover method for this. So we set up four transects per grid, and we sampled 10 times along each transect, leaving me 40 samples per grid. So the 16 grids, that was a lot of vegetation samples. But it gave a very clear picture of the vegetation composition within 
mechanics method was trapping the small mammals. So a Sherman line traps were set up in a 10 trap by 10 trap grid with 15 meters separating each trap. They were baited at sunset and then at sunrise the traps were processed and the animals were taken out and identified in weight, sex, ear tag, and then released at their site of capture. And each grid was trapped for three consecutive nights with a total of 4,800 trap nights for this study. So the first set result is the soil analysis. We did not see any significant differences in pH across any of the treatment areas. Um, so there, that's just one thing we can rule out as far as the positive differences in diversity or richness. Um, the next interesting thing though was the compaction of penetrance resistance. A lot of studies in this area will show you that um, because the horses are trampling and they're alternating topsoil, you're going to have increased soil compaction in areas that are occupied by ground horses. But in this study, we actually found the opposite, where both in the native vegetation area and in the seeded area, the area occupied by horses actually can lower soil compaction. So that was a unique trend that's counter to what we expected. And then this is just a visual comparison of my treatment areas. That one is seeded, and you can see it's essentially a monoculture of, of one type of grass species. There's very few other species present, and if they are, they're in very low, low frequency. Um, this is a native vegetation treatment area, and you can see that there's a bunch of different types of shrubs and grasses and other plants coming. So you can just visually see the difference in biodiversity as far as vegetation, and obviously that's going to foster greater biodiversity. As far as vegetation analysis, this is just a really quick summary of everything. Like I said, I love samples. So this is just a comparison of the percent cover and the importance values of shrubs and grasses in the treatment areas. And the first trend is that you do see reduced percent cover, not significant, but you do see reduced percent cover in areas that are occupied by horses, which makes sense because they're grazing the plants. Um, so then the next thing is if you compare between the seeded area and the native area, you see that the seeded areas obviously have much, much higher percent cover of grasses and the grasses within those areas have the highest importance so values, much more frequent. And then in the next area, you see that in the native vegetation area, you see that shrubs have well, take up much more of the percent cover and also have higher importance values than if you compare to the seeded area. So it just kind of shows the differences between how many shrubs and grasses are present and in what frequency. So this is a summary of the mammal species captured. Um, the dominant species across all birds and tree areas was Paramecium paniculatus, or the common deer mouse, so it's a general species. It wasn't unexpected that you would see that one in such high number. The other two species that you can see in every single year without fail were the great bison and pocket mouse, Peregrinus harvest, and then um, the harvest mouse, Brethodonimus megalotus. And then from there, it was just kind of a smattering of miscellaneous voles and rats and one shrimp. So this is the final thing. Um, we got to compare the diversity and the richness of these species and what was interesting is the area with the highest diversity was the area that had native vegetation and horses present. So, and then the next highest was the area with seeded, but it didn't have horses present, which is kind of convoluted. And there's no clear cut trend as to whether or not you're seeing um, seedings or the horses specifically having an effect on the diversity. And I use two different diversity indices. The first is the Simpson Inverse Index, which is just a general diversity index. The next is the uh, Shannon-Wiener, which is another general diversity index, but it's more sensitive for a species. And in both uh, indices, you see the same trend as far as there isn't really anything native vegetation or seedings or the presence of horses or not that's affecting the diversity of these of the small mammals. The interesting trend comes with the richness. In the Schnabel index, if you look at um, the richness of the, the species present, you do see that richness is a lot lower in areas that have been reseeded, which is an interesting trend. It's not significant just because it's been an error, but it is an interesting trend that these do see that much of a difference in the richness values. So from this, we decided that we, prediction one was not necessarily supported. We did not see that species diversity and richness was consistently lower in areas occupied by horses, and actually, we did see the area with the highest diversity in there were the treatment areas that were had native vegetation but didn't have horses in them. And then again, prediction two was not completely supported because we did see we didn't see that species diversity was consistently lower in any of the treatment areas um, that had been reseeded, but we did see that richness tended to be lower in the seeded areas. So there's definitely something there that warrants further research, but it isn't completely conclusive that the reseedings are affecting diversity or richness. So from this we include that Frail horse choosing does not appear to contribute to reduce small mammal diversity and richness, but reseedings may be having a serious effect on the richness of species within this herd management.
Um, and I think the underlying message here is that it's not so much the presence or absence of feral horses, but rather the land use management practices that are contributing to the health of the rain land and thus the biodiversity of the small that is present. So um, if this study were repeated in the area that were not as managed as well, you would probably see a difference that could be attributed, attributed to the presence of feral horses. But in this particular herd management area, the feral horses themselves do not appear to be a cause for difference in the biodiversity of small animals. And you can definitely say that more research on the effects of receiving is needed because we just there's something going on, there's a trend that's affecting the richness, but it is anything that that's clear cut that we can decide from this research. Um, and the next step would be multi-regression using the data we obtained to elucidate the relationships between the landscape and the 